Hello everyone and welcome back. As you can see, I'm back in New York, uh, which means I don't have very much time on my hands, which is why this video will at least hopefully be a shorter one. So rather than read a full-on academic paper this week, uh, what I decided to do is research a topic that I've been meaning to look into a bit more anyway, which is Apache Arrow. Now I want to apologize in advance. Uh, my handwriting on this one is really terrible for some reason. I don't know why, but just like my right wrist has been in so much pain recently. Like specifically like the last, you know, one to two days, that thing has just been hurting me. So uh, yeah, not looking good, uh, but we're going to do the best that we can here. And also, I don't know, my tissues are in low supply, so that's, you know, weird correlation there. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into the video and talk about Arrow. I think it's a really cool one. All right, so as mentioned, today we're going to be talking about Apache Arrow, which is very distinct from Cupid's Arrow that Karinikov regularly shoots into my heart. So Apache Arrow is basically an in-memory columnar data format that was developed in 2016. As you can see, it's, you know, out of, it has an Apache license, meaning it's open source, you can develop it yourself. There are a few companies that actively maintain it, but I would say for the most part, this is an open source project and it's very actively being worked on. So it's an in-memory columnar data format specifically for data analytics. So these are a few terms that we've talked about a little bit in the past, but uh, we'll touch upon them quite a bit more. So one thing that is important to note about Arrow, because I think this columnar term might be a little bit confusing, is this explicitly is not a Parquet substitute. So Parquet is specifically a file format for uh, disk storage, and this is specifically made for in-memory. Now those lines are starting to get a little bit blurry in the past few years, but I guess I'm talking about uh, the original creation of this thing for the time being. So Arrow really focuses on interoperability, which basically means you can you know, read and write data in one program, and then you can instantly read and write that same data in another program without having to copy it over or you know, translate it or serialize it and deserialize it. And this is what really makes Arrow special. That saves us a lot of time, uh, you know, not doing all of these unnecessary conversions. So this is going to allow us to perform something known as zero copy reads, which we'll talk about. And then finally, they took this guy even a step further, and ultimately they implemented something known as flight, or even further than that, Flight SQL, which basically is taking Arrow and extending it such that not only are you keeping this data stored in memory, uh, but you're also able to send it over the network. So this is going to help us avoid serialization and deserialization of data into bytes. Cool. So let's talk about the need for Arrow in the first place. I think the example that I'm going to give is one that their CTO gave in a talk that I watched, and I'm gonna link all these sources in the video description. So let's imagine that we're using something like PySpark, right? So basically this is a Python front end for Spark, and Spark is ultimately something that runs in the JVM or the Java virtual machine. So basically, if uh, we're using PySpark and we take a Python object, we take our Python object, we convert it into a Java object, we do some processing on the Java object, and then ultimately we convert that right back into a Python object for us to use. Maybe in pandas, maybe we're just running some normal for loops on it or this and that. But the point is, look at all of these copies that we had to do. We have to go Python to Java and Java back to Python. And ultimately, that is going to waste a lot of time, right? When we're talking about big data, well, it's big data because it's big, and so copying it is very expensive. So how can we actually go ahead and avoid this? Well, basically, if every single program was able to look at the same bytes in memory and interpret them the same way and operate on them the same way, well, then I suppose we wouldn't really ever actually have to copy that memory over. We could basically just give a pointer from one program to the other, and then both programs could use that pointer, operate on that memory the same way, and all would be good to go. So obviously, right now, uh, because we have all these disjoint programs that are operating on data, they have different representations of data and memory. But if we could standardize that, we could get a lot of great performance benefits. And so that's kind of the idea behind this term, zero copy. So, you know, imagine Python, we're able to just say, hey, you know, go take a look at this memory right here. Java, you can use that, and then they're both able to just do so and pass it back and forth. Well, we're gonna save a lot of time. And so what is that format actually going to look like? Well, as far as Arrow is concerned, we want it to be columnar. So we've spoken about column-oriented storage uh, plenty of times on this channel, but just to quickly reiterate the point behind why we use this thing, basically it is a lot better than row-oriented storage for analytical workloads. So most of our databases that we would use for OLTP or just like you know normal web applications are uh, row-oriented, right? So typically we'll care about one row at a time and we want to access that entire row, get it back, maybe modify it. Column-oriented storage, on the other hand, is really nice when we care about you know, a single or two or three columns at a time out of a massive table with many, many columns, right? And this is often the case when we're doing data analytics. Like, we only care about one column, maybe we want to sum it up, maybe we want to filter it down, take a mean, something like that. But the advantages of this is, one, we only have to read the columns that we want. Because all of the data within a column is stored next to each other on disk, or in this case in memory, 
uh, we just have to read uh, those offsets as opposed to having to like interleave all of our reads and jumping around to get just the column that we want. Uh, number two is that because all the volumes in a column are very similar, we can compress them more easily. So we'll talk about some of the compression methods in a little bit. Uh, but the gist is, you know, this is going to enable us to use a lot less storage. If we use less storage, this means that let's say we're reading a file from disk, uh, we're going to spend less time reading that file, right? Because disks are limited in terms of their I.O. And so if you're literally reading less data from your disk, that's a good thing. We want that. Uh, it also just means if you're sending that data over the network, there's less network I.O., which is also another thing because network can also be a bottleneck in our systems. Finally, because of the fact that all the values within the same column are next to one another on disk, and we typically do the same operation on values within the same column, we can take advantage of SIMD registers. So I spoke about this a bit in the Snowflake video. SIMD registers just basically means that you can perform the same exact operation in parallel on a CPU, but it only takes one clock cycle to do so. So for example, you know, if we we're performing like a filter on all the elements in a certain column, we could actually do that in parallel and maybe boost our performance on that particular column by 8x or 16x or 64x, deciding, uh, you know, depending on that register. Cool. So let's dive into the actual arrow format itself a little bit more. Basically, like Parquet, there are going to be some headers and some metadata for each column. Maybe each column has a data type associated with it. And in this case, uh, you know, we've got one column over here, Jordan's Girlfriends, their rating out of 10, and of course, their last text to Jordan. So Jordan's Girlfriends is just a typical string column. As you can see, it's of high ordinance, so we just keep the string as is. So we've got these guys over here. Solid sample size for sure. Uh, you know, one might say Jordan's done pretty well in life. Number two is their rating out of 10. So you might notice that, hey, wait a second, this column does not have four different values right here. It only has two, a 10 and a zero. Well, this is because this column in particular is run end encoded, right? So basically what we're saying is, okay, at index three, we stop having tens, and here at index four, we stop having a zero. So it's basically saying, okay, this is representing 10, 10, 10, zero. Now the nice thing about run end uh, encoding compared to run length encoding, which we've also spoken about on this channel, is just if I say, okay, well, uh, you know, imagine I wanted to figure out who lives at index two, I can do a binary search by actually finding three is bigger than two, and you know, we implicitly start with zero, and then we can binary search between those two values. Cool. The other type of uh, encoding that we might do in these uh, files, or rather in this memory format, is also dictionary encoding. So this is really good when we have things like strings, which are fairly expensive to store because they're big, uh, but there are only a limited quantity of them. So in this case, you know, we've only got two different types of last text that I've received from uh, this grouping of people. And uh, because of that, we can represent them as just a single bit, a zero or one. Uh, so it's really, really inexpensive to represent these on disk. And then we just go ahead and write those all out. And in theory, this could even be, you know, run end encoded as well. So this would really look like zero, three, and then uh, one, four, right? So that would be your run end encoding. So this is basically going to allow us uh, to, you know, basically keep all of our data uh, relatively compressed, not too compressed, but relatively compressed in memory. And as long as all of the programs that we care about have basically implemented some way of reading arrow data, which many of them are starting to because this is a rapidly growing open source project, we have incredible interoperability. So another interesting thing is, okay, well, that's all on memory, right? What would actually happen if we tried to put arrow on disk? So like we said, uh, you know, arrow is meant for memory. Can we store it on disk? And so this is a distinctly different thing than Parquet in the sense that Arrow only does this lightweight compression, or at least that's what it's supposed to be doing, right? So lightweight compression is stuff like this where it's like run-end encoding and dictionary encoding insofar as you can actually you know, read the data and like figure out what's going on without having to run an entire compression algorithm, which is going to expand the size of it greatly. Like in run-end encoding and in dictionary encoding, you kind of have a one-to-one -one mapping between the data itself and the number of rows, or I guess I should better say, like you can go through this data, uh, directly put it into CPU registers and operate on it. Whereas with uh, compression, you have to actually decompress that and it's going to expand the size of the data and you don't know what the expanded size of the data is going to be. So I guess Parquet is kind of doing that heavyweight compression as well, right? We might be using Snappy, Gzip, or Z standard. You're taking a Parquet file, you're compressing it. Now, that's not to say that you can't take arrow data and also compress it. I guess it's just not always something that you'll do. So what does arrow do if we want to store arrow on disk? Because, you know, one common pattern is to just store Parquet on disk. 
read it back into memory and then convert that into arrow, which is fine. However, of course, then you do actually have this conversion cost. You have to take data on disk and convert it back into arrow. On the contrary, storing data in this arrow IPC, which stands for interprocess communication or feather format, is basically going to allow you to basically store arrow data as is in memory on disk and then be able to ideally read it back pretty quickly. And so one thing that we can do here, which is kind of interesting that I've seen them talk a little bit about uh, in the arrow docs and kind of some of the presentations is something known as memory mapping. So memory mapping is basically a functionality of the operating system that you can do when reading files. So when typically when you read a file, uh, you know, you've got your disk, you've got your memory, you've got some CPU and some registers. Typically the program itself will allocate some RAM, maybe a small chunk of it, right? Because maybe you're reading chunks of the file at a time, but you do have to, you know, manually allocate some memory uh, in the user process. And then we'll read that file into the RAM and then from there the CPU will read that data, right? So we have that normal process. In memory mapping, on the contrary, what you'll do is the operating system is actually managing these allocations for you. So basically, uh, we have this concept of physical memory and virtual memory. So if you're not remembering your operating systems too much, basically virtual memory is an abstraction that each program has its own limitless set of RAM that is completely contiguous. And in reality, uh, that's not going to be the case. You might store stuff in some sort of memory range, but it can be anywhere on physical RAM. And then there's something known as the memory mapping unit, which is actually performing that conversion for you behind the scenes. The point is, when we memory map a file to the program, it, you basically get the illusion of saying like, oh, you can just access this piece of a file at this address in memory. And so at that time, no allocations are actually done in your RAM. However, when you do eventually access a particular address of the file by accessing a particular address of your virtual memory, then the allocation uh, will be done lazily by your operating system. So in theory, this can lead to a little bit less memory allocation than basically naively allocating a slightly bigger buffer. And so, you know, allocations are bad, they slow things down. Ideally, we don't wanna do those as much as possible. And this is why Arrow can also be really, really fast. Cool. Uh, let's talk about Parquet and Arrow in general. I guess basically the question is, uh, you know, why can't we do this memory mapping with Parquet? I think this kind of ties back to the, you know, heavy compression that I was talking about, right? Even though we can memory map a Parquet file and access a specific, you know, random entry of it, random reads in Parquet are not really very feasible because of the fact that it's compressed, right? Like if I wanna randomly access a certain index in that Parquet file, I have to actually access more of it so that I can go decompress the whole thing and then I can access a random piece of it in memory. So you end up just allocating a ton of memory for the whole thing anyway. Now this is not to say that Parquet files are necessarily worse. Uh, in actual benchmarks, sometimes compressed Parquet files can be better, right? Because sometimes you'll have situations where it's like the Snowflake paper where uh, all these files are being stored in S3 and they need to be loaded over the network first before they can actually be read into memory. And so if you're gonna load them over the network, it's probably better for you to just store as small of a file as possible, uh, which is what Parquet goes for with all of this heavy compression. However, maybe if you're actually reading on the same system, right, like you're reading a file locally from disk, it's possible that maybe that feather format is going to be better for you. So I guess it's a question of, you know, look at your system. Is that worth the trade-off? Benchmark, I'm, you know, completely spewing. You have to actually go try it out for yourself. So the last piece of this video that is very interesting about Arrow is uh, this thing called Flight. So I think Flight came out in 2020, or I want to say maybe 2019. Uh, but the gist is, right, we have all this data that we can use and share between many different programs. Wouldn't it be great if we could share them between those programs that were actually running on different systems? Well, how do we send data between those systems? We do it over the network. What if it was the case that we could take our arrow data, not have to serialize or deserialize it at all, just send it over the network, you know, in the bytes that it's currently represented as, and then the receiving party could just natively understand that, never have to deserialize it, and operate it directly on memory, or operate on it directly in memory. That would be a pretty huge savior in performance. And so basically that's what they went ahead and implemented. So Aeroflight is going to allow us to avoid serialization and deserialization. It basically looks something like this. It, you can think of it as like a couple of different protocol buffer RPC calls where um, you know, there's a couple of metadata requests where you, know, you go to some sort of metadata server and you say, hey, you know, like I wanna fetch a certain amount of data. It's going to give you a list of IP addresses to fetch it from and you know, perhaps a couple of requests to send there. And then you can actually, as a client, go to a bunch of different data servers, 
ask them for the data, and they'll just begin streaming it to you. And so what's nice about this is you don't really have to do like a scatter gather query, right? Like this isn't going back through the metadata server. You're actually just reaching out directly to the data servers. Now, this isn't necessarily unique to, to flight in general. I, th I think the unique thing about flight is just, hey, you're actually getting arrow data, which means no serialization, no deserialization. If both sides are prepared to do that, that can save you a ton of time. I think uh, I was watching a couple of talks where basically the developers were talking about how you know great this is compared to something like ODBC or JDBC. Uh, where those are basically common database connectors. And the gist is, like, if you're using ODBC or you're using JDBC, every single database has their own uh, implementation of, like, taking data and converting it to one of those standards, right, so that it can be sent over the wire to, you know, an ODBC client or a JDBC client. But then you're doing a ton of copying. You're potentially taking columnar data, converting it into a row-oriented format, and then converting it back into a column-oriented format. And that's just so much work. It's such a waste of time. It doesn't make any sense. If you're going to be having a basically column-oriented client and a column-oriented database, there's pretty much absolutely no reason that you wouldn't want to send it uh, using Arrow. You don't have to do any conversion into row space. Uh, you avoid an extra serialization and deserialization. It's just a major win. Now, on top of Flight, uh, they've also built something known as Flight SQL. Flight SQL, at least from my initial research, I would say, uh, again, don't quote me on this, seems like it's basically like, uh, you know, you're adding a few additional types of commands to the kind of protocol interface that these servers support. So like, you know, if this is a flight SQL server, it's gonna expose a few different endpoints, some of which are gonna be like, hey, tell me what tables you have. Hey, uh, what are the schema of those tables? Hey, here's a query, please return me the data of those tables. And so this is going to enable building SQL databases on top of flight, which of course, a lot of people are starting to use more and more. Okay, so let's go ahead and quickly conclude. I'm pretty happy with the length of this video. It wasn't too long. But basically the gist is Arrow isn't just a standardized memory format. They've built other stuff on top of it. They've built this disk format called uh, Feather or IPC, whatever you want to call it. And they've also built a wire protocol uh, to basically you know, do no serialization, no deserialization when sending data over the network, which is known as Flight. And so as we can see, if you're using Arrow throughout your system and you're completely Arrow native per se, you can save a ton of time on copying data. And I think it's going to be very interesting in the years coming to see how systems actually try and build around this technology to, to really avoid all of these unnecessary copies. Uh, again, being column oriented, like even if Arrow was row oriented, you would get a lot of these benefits. But in addition to that, you know, the file format that they ultimately did choose to go with was specifically made for data analytics insofar as it's column oriented. And to reiterate, basically that just means you only get the columns that you need, great for analytic workloads. You get compression within a column, which is great for limiting the amount of IO that you're doing. And then finally, you also get SIMD execution because that data needs to be next to one another in memory for it to go right into those registers and uh, be operated on in parallel. Anyways, guys, I hope that you found the, the short video useful. Uh, I think it was certainly a fun one for me to research, and I'm actually kind of excited to do more of this, just like, hey, look through documentation, use ChatGPT, watch some YouTube videos, figure stuff out. Uh, you know, it's nice for me to kind of go back and forth between the papers and that style of video. So let me know how you liked it. But anyways, I will see you all in the next one.